Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy. My guest today is Amrita Wasson. Amrita is the Director of Programs at the Center for Economic Democracy. As an educator, organizer, and solidarity economy practitioner, they situate themselves in the interstices between individual and collective liberation. This focus has led to projects as diverse as cultural campaigns promoting healthy relationships in the LGBTQIA communities, collectivization of resources for hyper-local grant making, building multiple cooperative businesses, working to support youth both inside and outside schools with their creative and political desires, and creating spaces and economic opportunities for survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Amrita, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. So I'm curious how you first got into the work you're doing today. Can you give us a little bit about your background and yeah, how you first got interested in solidarity economy and some of these bigger, bigger picture ideas? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I, like many immigrants, you know, coming from other parts of the world where the onslaught of like global capitalism was really vivid. And in India, we had like a social infrastructure that wasn't based on a capitalist system completely. And having seen like really robust public banks and seeing robust cooperatives and these large level infrastructure that was based on socialist principles, even if it wasn't a socialist political environment, and then have seen in the 90s, the onslaught of global imperialism, global capitalism kind of start to destroy that and the environmental degradation of it. So it was mostly like coming to this work from deep heartbreak, right? Like seeing the potential of what could be possible in terms of alternative systems and then seeing global capitalism destroy that. And then thinking about as coming of age, like how do I want to be involved in being part of building something different, right? What does that next economy look like? And in the U.S., like, you know, I've been part of U.S. social movements for a while now, both in gender justice, immigrant rights, and in the cooperative economy movement. And most recently, I was teaching U.S. history in high school. And what was really surprising to me as I was teaching U.S. history in high school was that the strongest emotional reactions students would have, like high schoolers would have while studying U.S. history was not Black resistance during enslavement or indigenous resistance during the ravages of colonialism, but was when we would study reconstruction. And it was because, you know, they could see how there was a promise and possibility in terms of U.S. history of like this moment where anything was possible, right? And so much was being done by Black leadership at that time, and then the loss of that promise. And I think that that was like really devastating to them in terms of studying U.S. history because they were, in terms of the trajectory, it was like, okay, this is the moment where things get better, right? And then you have the election of Andrew Johnson and the loss of that promise. And studying that at a time when Trump was coming into presidency, so the parallels weren't lost on these young people as to the moment that we've been in and we are still in right now. And from that, even in terms of my work outside of the schools in building cooperative enterprises and working with community, I think that for me, joining the Center of Economic Democracy was about bringing in all these threads of understanding of history and really leaning into like ownership, ownership over our own labor or finding spaces where collective stewardship of resources was possible or finding pathways for that reparative, restorative work that needs to happen. So it's not another reconstruction style loss and heartbreak of the promise of this moment. Absolutely. And can you give folks a sense of this Center for Economic Democracy itself and some of the main issues or or programs that you work on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the Center for Economic Democracy, you know, we're really just trying to create containers and spaces for democratic practice, right? Infrastructural interventions that are not just technical, but really transformative cultural spaces 
that kind of expand our capacities to self-govern and to hold like different visions and different, you know, with integrity and like to in- innovate decision making by showing, you know, by doing and not just talking about it, right? So like to be in this iterative process with community in building out these new containers. So some of the way that that work looks for us is that is through participatory budgeting in Boston or building out supports for cooperatives from the state legislature or worker ownership in multiple different ways to create that environment in Massachusetts. It looks like really looking at impact investing and seeing where it hasn't met the mark, right? And it hasn't delivered what we were hoping for, the kind of transformation we were hoping for, and where are the ways in which we can iterate and innovate to allow for that to happen. It also includes a lot of deep educational and capacity building work with BIPOC communities across the U.S. who are trying to do work at the intersection of resist and build, right? And to really analyze and understand the current economy and what alternatives have existed across history and across different parts of the world. So we have a deeper understanding ourselves and then we can collectively come to an analysis of what is it that we want in that next economy? What are the skills that we need to be able to embody the enterprises or the governments of the future? So that's a lot of what Center for Economic Democracy works on or the big ideas that we follow. I love all those things. That These are each like threads of different podcast episodes. I feel like we could just go deep dive into, <laughs> you know, could you define for folks, you know, we've talked about it a few times. I should mention we had Aaron Tanaka, one of the, you know, the co-founder of the Center for Economic Democracy on a few years ago. And so folks might not have heard or we've have heard it, but maybe just re-looking at it might be helpful. Can you describe what the solidarity economy is and sort of like how it maybe operates within our broader capitalist system, or it's maybe a separate piece? I'm just, how do you kind of view the solidarity economy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's like a lot of different terminology that folks use. The solidarity economy is one of the terms. Economic democracy is one of the terms. Folks use regenerative economy, feminist economy. There's like a whole slew of terms. Yeah. Uh, Next economy, diverse. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, yeah. As diverse as our, you know, as our expressions are as humans. But I think at the core of it, what we're really talking about is that people and communities owning and deciding together, right? Like we're owning and deciding together how to manage our collective needs, you know, be it housing, food, whatever that might be. And being able to like dream together and plan and build something sustainable for ourselves and the, you know, the generations that are coming. And I think that, you know, and it comes, the term solidarity come, economy particularly comes to us from Latin American movements, right? South American movements. And a lot of what that looks like in the U.S., a lot of people might be part of the solidarity economy and not even realize it, right? So it's everything from like your clothing swaps to, you know, folks who are living in collective housing as they're young and, you know, don't have resources to afford rent or to really robust, elegant mutual aid networks that have developed, particularly over the course of the pandemic, to the idea of cooperative businesses and public banks and uh, land trusts, any structures and systems and ways of being, cultural ways of being that allow us to actually be in engagement with one another, to really not deny our basic human instinct to care for one another. So a lot of people also refer to it as the care economy, right? Caring for our elders, caring for one another. And a lot of the principles of the solidarity economy really came out during the pandemic where you saw, I mean, we saw a lot of missteps in terms of governance, but at the same time, we saw a lot of communities really showing up for one another, you know, buying groceries for elderly neighbors so they didn't have to leave their home or setting up like, water drop-offs or diaper drop-offs, ensuring that people were meeting their medical appointments, things like that, that unfortunately come at a moment of crisis and become really visible during a moment of crisis. But it is a natural, instinctual part of how we function as humans in community, in care for one another. You know, that looks like the cultural interpersonal, but also entire systems built on that those principles of care and ensuring that when we are looking at needs, we're looking at 
the needs of all and not just looking at the needs of, you know, upper class few, right? So that's kind of what we mean by solidarity economy or economic democracy. Perfect. Yeah. One reason I'm asking is sort of a a bit of a random sidebar, but I've been speaking with my uncle who's, (laughs) so he's like a, a right wing Trump supporter. And the idea is that the reason I'm talking to him is to try and I think be a little more humble and try to learn because I think there's like surface level stuff of like, this is what I disagree with him on X, Y, Z, but I'm trying to get at like, what is the more emotional like undertones and try to understand that side. And one thing I'm having a trouble with, and this is sort of, again, like a random question for you, but I think there's a challenge with the word, like people react very strongly to the word like socialism versus something like solidarity economy. And I'm curious, is do you see any distinction between them? Or like, how do you sit with sort of the, maybe the baggage of a word like socialism versus solidarity economy? And is there any difference in your mind? I think that, so we have a curriculum at the Center for Economic Democracy that's called Economics for Emancipation, where we really unpack economic systems that have existed historically in the world. And I think that a lot of times command style economies where there is a very strong state in a dictatorial fashion or not necessarily even in a dictatorial fashion, but in a very command style fashion, imposing a structure or imposing its own agenda on a people. And I think that a lot of times when we are talking about socialism, there is a lack of nuance, right? There's a difference between socialist principles and thinking and thought and, you know, and philosophy and ways of being that I think is very alive in in the United States and the history of the Cold War and the history of command style economies that kind of sullies that. So I think that part of our job in movements now is to really start to get to more complex conversations and build our capacity to have like complex conversations and nuanced conversations about what are the actual values and principles and ways of being that we're talking about. And I bet like, even with your uncle, if you're talking about care, right. And if you're talking about collective needs and meet like that, our resources need to be used to meet collective needs I think like the conversation sometimes needs to be at that level rather than kind of ideologically insisting on terminology. Yes, absolutely. Like how do we meet basic human needs as opposed to is this system we're calling, is it an ism? Is it that ism or, or this ism? Like is our current system meeting our needs? And mm. anybody who's seen the, you know, the last few years of being in this pandemic it's very clear that we weren't able to meet the demands of this moment, right? And that with climate crisis, those demands are going to be a lot larger. So we need a robust structural system that actually allows for needs to be met in a more democratic way and in a way that is in the right relationship with the earth, right? Or with nature or non-human nature, as we like to say, because humans are part of nature. And I think that's where we need to iterate and that's where we need to move to in practice in like really practicing democracy together, like small d democracy together. You mentioned a few things that Center for Economic Democracy is working on, you know, participatory budgeting, you know, employee ownership, cooperative initiatives, you know, things like capital advisory, funder organizing, municipal democracy, public banks, public land trusts. Is there any of these that you're like particularly excited about right now? Like just feeling very energized by? Oh my goodness, Ryan, I'm energized by all of it. So I will say that what's been really exciting, I think since Aaron was on the podcast, is that last year in November, like over 80,000 people in Boston voted to amend the city's charter. And that hadn't Mm. happened since the late 1900s or something. And basically, it was the first question on the ballot. And it made Boston's budget process like more transparent, more accountable, more democratic. And in multiple ways, like one was that it allowed city councilors to be better represented. So earlier, the budget could only be voted up or down by city councilors. So they didn't have much say in how the, the details of the budget were. 
but now it allows city councilors who are more in representative of their particular communities in the city, they have a chance, like gave them the tools to kind of amend and improve the mayor's budget and be in conversation with the mayor, right? Like be in close conversation with the mayor about what they're hearing from community. And so that allowed for a, a deeper level of transparency and accountability. And then the second thing was that it required participatory budgeting. So the idea is by 2024, the city is going to create an independent office that allows community members to propose and vote on parts of the city budget. And this is really exciting for us because right now what we're doing at Center for Economic Democracy, along with this coalition that made this amendment happen, is that we are talking together about what that process might look like. And what's been really exciting about that is that as part of that process is to have these spaces, these community assemblies, where we are identifying needs in our communities and then iterating what possible solutions to those needs. And it allows folks to be in a neighborhood or in a community, be in conversation with one another, right? To be able to speak to one another about, oh, like their needs. So like someone might be like, you know, we need a young person who's desperate to have a rec center or green space to actually be in half space outside of their apartment or their home to be with people, with friends or play sports or any of that, having someone else who's interested in a dog park, like actually be in conversation with this person face to face and be like, oh, okay, I see your need. You know, I understand. And I don't think we have enough spaces, community spaces or assemblies where folks can actually talk to one another and understand what their neighbors are going through or want. And I think that our hope is that with these assemblies, folks will be able to identify the key needs that they're facing in each each neighborhood and go through this really robust process where community partners who've been working in Boston for base building organizations, as well as community organizations that have been working in Boston for many, many, many years, will have a chance to run these assemblies in partnership with support from the city and with technical assistance from the city to make the ideas that residents are coming up with realities, right? Like the the ideas that residents are coming up with to actually work them and workshop them into actual projects that can benefit community. And, you know, it's an iterative process. It's going to be the first time that Boston as a whole city will be doing this. And I'm sure that there's going to be obstacles and there's going to be things that we didn't anticipate or missteps and all of that. But that's what I mean by having spaces of democratic practice, even in designing this office and in designing this process, there's a lot of community that's involved in multiple languages that's informing how this process is so that it allows for us to iterate together, that we're moving through building participatory budgeting for Boston together. And I think some of that success has probably come through Boston Ujima project, like experience with Boston Ujima project and others, right? Like sort of the, the community assemblies, did that inform at all the sort of like larger push for Boston? Absolutely. Ujima is one of our partners and definitely part of the coalition, but also like the history is, is longer, right? Like it's almost a decade long, if not longer with the Boston Workers Alliance. They launched, I think, I want to say around 2010, the District Dollars Campaign to promote participatory budgeting in Boston. Right to the city in Boston has been, you know, has participatory budgeting as part of its policy platform for at least a decade. A lot of community leaders have been coming together and talking about the city's charter and put out a city charter reform report before this amendment was even suggested. So it comes out of a lot of work, particularly also within the youth participatory budgeting process in Boston. So it comes out of Ujima and the Youth Participatory Budgeting Process, Boston Workers Coalition, all of that work that's been happening in Boston for a really long time. And all of those conversations and the study that these community members did together, informing this amendment and informing this win, really, for Boston. And those same folks continuing to inform how we move forward together across communities to make this a reality. And we've been learning a lot from, with participatory budgeting project, a lot from what's been happening internationally, say in Puerto Alegre in Brazil, or in Seattle, in Chicago, in New York, and those examples and learning from those, those folks as well in terms of informing how 
this process gets designed. You know, I'm curious if you have any advice for listeners who are like, why don't we have participatory budgeting in my city? Can you give folks a sense of like, what are the conditions or what are some of the key things that you might say to somebody who wants to move this forward? Yeah, in their area. I think that the core of it is to find your people, right? The core of it is to find the folks who are in the fights around the budget, right? Who are tired of the repetitive cycles of constantly fighting for needs to be met through the budget. And I think like that's part of that resist and build intersection of fighting the same fights over and over again. And then finding in ourselves through collective work, the agency to push for an alternative structure. And that there's a lot of support available in examples internationally, but also with the participatory budgeting project in New York, or I mean, I think they're national, but their offices are in New York. But just learning from them in terms of what they've gathered from all of these different studies in terms of technical support. But I think at the core of it, it has to be like, who is the community most affected by bad budget decisions repeatedly? And what is the organizing happening in that community? And where are people tired of city leaders not delivering on budget promises? And I think like that's the right place where this kind of exploration could come from. Yeah, I love the idea of finding your people. That's great. Because it, this is clearly like a movement piece. It's not like you're going to sort of change a politician's mind with a you know, solo phone call. It's like, how are you part of a broader movement to do something? So I really like that advice. What about other, some of these other larger programs you're involved with? Anything else giving you a lot of energy right now? Yeah, we're, you know, in terms of worker ownership, you know, CD along with a lot of our partners co-host the Coalition for Worker Ownership and Power. So it's a Massachusetts-wide coalition. And there's a really robust policy platform that that's part of that this coalition has been putting forth, which is looking at, it comes from the assessment of the co-op sector and seeing what we really need to be at appropriate scale, right? Like not just growth for the sake of growth, but to actually have sustainable, like what do the sustainable long-term enterprises of the future look like? And what do BIPOC cooperative business workers and entrepreneurs really need to build power through these enterprises? So the policy platform looks at training for worker owners, supportive grants and loan guarantees, you know, technical assistance. It's not different from what, you know, when we started, like when a new industry is born, like not different from the kinds of support like the tech industry or other industries in the U.S. when they were first starting out have received from government, right? So we are asking for a similar level of support for the cooperative industry. But particularly the piece that I'm most excited about is the idea of co-determination, which is really is the norm in places like Germany, right? Where you require large companies to have employees with full rights on corporate boards. So what we are asking for is requiring large companies with over a hundred million in annual revenue to ensure that a minimum of 40% of its board of directors be elected by the employees of the corporation, right? With the same duties and responsibilities as directors elected by the stockholders. And part of this is that the enterprises of the future that the world demands right now requires all of our expertise. It requires not just being informed by the interests of capital, you know, and stockholders, but also being informed by the needs and interests of workers. I mean, we've seen over the pandemic that literally the thing that got us through was essential workers. None of these folks were like, I didn't know I was essential till I, you know, till the pandemic hit. And the belief that without the input from the folks who are creating the value in our economy, actual folks building and creating value in our economy, this is where we keep going wrong, right? This is where all the missteps in terms of corporate governance come from, is because there is no expertise, there is no worker input into corporate governance. And so that's one of the places where we are really looking at co-determination 
and also that it is the norm in other parts of the world and that it is possible. It's not something that's impossible or unheard of. And what would that look like for us to start making that the norm here in the U.S.? You know, as you're thinking about this, this work and some of the different initiatives you're involved with, what are the top two to three things that keep you up at night about them? Like, oh, if we really, we really need this to happen or, yeah, what, what are those things that you're like thinking about at night that are really like, we need this to happen or this is a problem or if we can fix this? I'm kind of curious for that. I honestly don't stay up at night thinking about, <laughs> not to answer your question literally, but figuratively, you know, like there is, if I might just jump into some poetry for a second, there is like this Sufi poet from the 13th century called Amir Khusro. And he has this couplet, and I can say it in Urdu first, and I'll explain. So he says, Khusro darya prem ka ulti wa ki dhar, jo ubhra so dub gaya, jo duba so par. And basically what he's saying that, you know, this, this idea of love is kind of a river that goes in the opposite direction, right? It works in an opposite logic. Those of us who keep our head above the surface are sure to drown. And those of us who allow ourselves to completely be submerged are the ones who are gonna get across. And I feel like the moment that we're in is about making a collective commitment, right? Making a commitment to like live with integrity to ourselves and with one another to really submerge ourselves into the possibility that we can actually move out of the extractive, colonial, you know, white supremacist economic system that we've been part of by really submerging ourselves with other folks into this alternative, right? And that by keeping one foot in one system and one foot in another is not necessarily going to get us there. So I think it requires a level of faith and belief in our possibility to innovate as humans, to, or in our possibilities to understand history, to like understand reconstruction and say, oh, we know where we went wrong and we can do this differently this time. And I think that it's about understanding risk and return. Like right now, the majority of economic risk is being taken by folks who have the least amount of income they have the most to lose. Like folks who are are essential workers are taking the most amount of economic risk in our society right now. And part of what we need to do is like share that risk, right? Part of what we need to do is share that risk and share the returns. And part of our social movement investing work and the paper that we put out earlier this year is really looking at impact investing and saying, let's take it further right? Like where are the places where it didn't meet what we needed it to? And let's look at impact investing as a way to shift power. Without shifting power, we're going to keep coming up against the same results, right? And we're not going to hit, like, we're not going to get to the other shore of transformation. That's so beautiful. And I definitely did not expect to have 13th century Urdu (laughs) poems on this. And so I'm very grateful for you to bring that. And you know, you said one thing, you said many things that I resonate with. And then one thing that's actually very up for me is this idea of faith. You know, I'm not a religious person. I'm more of like a Buddhist. And I've been struggling with faith for a while because it's almost like I know the different strategies and tactics of living a good life or like an, a life aligned with, you know, a deeper purpose, like, you know, treat people well, work on dismantling systems of oppression, you know, try not to do this or that, that that are sort of like the strategy and tactics around, yeah, like a deeper purpose. But I've, I've realized I actually have lacked faith in the solutions or like our collective ability to actually overcome this sort of systems. And so it's been, even the last couple of weeks, I've sort of realized that you actually have to be like you were saying, like the, the poet you mentioned was saying is like be fully submerged in that sort of belief and that faith. And I think it's just really scary, but it's definitely something I'm realizing that I need to work on. And maybe perhaps other listeners too, is like stepping into that, that level of faith and actually seeing what it feels like, what it might actually feel like to work. So I, I just want to appreciate you for bringing that piece into the podcast. 
Absolutely. If you ever want Sufi poetry, I'm your person. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I feel like I'm somewhat limited to like Rumi. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, I know Sufi poet. But yes, I definitely need more than one Sufi poet. Or maybe Hafiz. Hafiz is Hafiz Sufi? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hafiz okay. too, yeah. All right. So I know two. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I think there's one other piece that it sort of dovetails what we just spoke about, but this center for economic democracy and what some of the things that you're working on point to is like, what is after capitalism? And I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you envision this idea of like after capitalism or, you know, like, like what's next? Like, do you see it as like, we're never really going to be, it's not like March 27th to, you know, 2030 is the date we're now after capitalism. Like it's, it's probably not going to be so sort of like stark. But how do you see that transition and, and how are you holding this idea of like moving to after capitalism? Yeah, that's a really good question and one that I think that a lot of folks are grappling with, particularly in social movements. I, I think it's about knowing the moment we are in right now. And the moment we are in right now is to be really, really discerning about false solutions. In a moment of having gone through and continuing to be in a pandemic with the increasing climate crises happening and needing to adapt to things that are out of our control in that realm, I think it's to be really discerning about not choosing false solutions out of comfort. And it does require that kind of courage, right? It requires us to be in rooms together and ask each other the hard questions and be very clear what the questions are that we are grappling with and working through together, right? So to me, this transition is not going to be easy. It's going to be a iterative process. It's going to be a process that's not overnight, right? It's going to require us all to build our capacities to govern together. It's going to require us capacities to understand and be with one another in different ways. It's going to require transformation. And that's not easy. But what it is, is it's it's real. It's It allows us to then live with integrity and the freedom and the liberation that comes with not having to deny reality because of fear, right? And the only way to me is to do that together. So where I am most enthused about this question or where I am most hopeful or optimistic about this question is the way in which social movements are coming together to talk about long-term strategy, right? Our social movements have, one, they have the deep on the ground knowledge, right? And they, the social movements and the community organizations that make up these social movements locally everywhere have a finger on the pulse, know the real impact of these environmental conditions, know the real impact of white supremacy and have the real information. This is why we're able, they were able to like put up mutual aid networks in a heartbeat that like literally saved people's lives, right? And so my trust is in folks in social movement coming together and strategizing together a path through this time. And I think what we need, and this is, you know, one of the things we talk about in the social movement investment paper is folks to be in accountable coordination with social movements, because throughout history, <laughs> that's what's allowed for transformation in the past, globally, as well as in the U.S. And to put our trust in and to bolster and to support and to be in close coordination with these folks who have the analysis, who are building the analysis, have the information, have the human know-how to organize large groups of people in loving, caring ways and take care of one another to move through a transformative time like this. So that's where I'm most curious about what's coming out of social movements, how to be in deep collaboration with that. And I think that having more and more spaces for democratic practice, which is why like, you know, it's great to have participatory budgeting and have you know, projects get funded that folks in the community are, are suggesting. But I also think that what perhaps is more exciting to me is the fact that 
people get to be together in assemblies and actually get to disagree with one another, be in principle, struggle with one another and build that capacity to hold one another with love, but also disagree and say like, okay, what are the compromises we can reach? Who needs to be centered in this conversation? Whose needs are really, really essential in this conversation, right? So yeah, I think like discursive spaces, like saying no to the false, the false solutions that are going to be offered because any moment like this in history, there has been false, like, you know, has been false solutions offered as a way to uphold the current system, as a way that the current system is going to try and save itself. And we need to be very discerning and say, no, that's not what we want. That is so beautifully said, being aware of the false solutions, being cautious about them, because I, I do agree there is a strong, deeply, deeply embedded immune system in our current system that wants to push us back towards comfort over, you know, happiness and solidarity. <laughs> so thank you for that. And, and also just, yeah, I feel like, again, there's so many threads I could take it, but I also want to be respectful of your time. And so one of the questions, the last two questions here. So what do you need right now? And is there anything that people, the listeners, is there anything they can do to help you grow this next economy? I think to be in conversation with us, everything that CED does is in coalition and collaboration. You know, we are putting out our economics for emancipation tools and curriculum online for folks, organizers to use across the country. You know, the social movement investment investing paper is out and our participatory budgeting and, you know, worker ownership work is out. So really encourage people to reach out and be in conversation with us. We love that. And also to really, you know, encourage folks to, you know, be committed where they are. I think we inspire like a lot of our work. We are really inspired by other folks who have spoken on Next Economy podcast, but other folks across the country who are doing incredible work. So just in other folks doing the work in their communities, that inspires us. And like, you know, we bolster one another. So that's what I would say. Do you want to drop like website or any social media or like places where folks can learn more about CED? Absolutely. Economicdemocracy.us is our website. And yeah, you can learn about any of the programs and work that we're doing that I mentioned on that website. Perfect. Great. Well, Amrita, this is so amazing. And I I really appreciate you sort of going off uh, into some of the deeper, like philosophical questions. Because sometimes the podcast interviews are very like technical, like do this, do this. And then some are like these bigger pieces, which I, I really appreciate going into. And so Hopefully the listeners got a similar experience and yeah, I just really want to appreciate you for coming on and hopefully we can have you back on the show in the, in the coming months and years. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the work that you do. Appreciate it. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.